Hello and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seekers. I'm your host, David the Skeptic, and I'm joined this week by a very special guest. Special guest, who are you? David Paulman. Uh, David yeah. Paulman. Wow. Okay. We It seems like we met just recently, not on SNS. Where did we meet, David? Uh, over on my podcast, Proselytize or Apostatize. Great. Hey, let me be the first one to uh, suggest new name for the show, Proselytize or Pasta. It's hard to say, hard to remember, uh, and I'm losing my memory. It took me probably an hour <laughs> this morning to, of, of, of heavy lifting, mental heavy lifting, to remember the name of this podcast. Um, why don't we just uh, shorten it and call it Apostasize and be done with it? Um <laughs> And uh, we also have another very special guest this week, who I am going to now turn the show over to for the sake of fairness. We're going to have a moderated discussion, and it's a moderator whose voice will be familiar to all of you, uh, Mr. Dale Glover. How are you doing, Hello. Dale? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, thanks for, for inviting me on to be a, a moderator for this discussion. You take it over. All right. So, so yeah, what we're going to do, it's going to be a, a little different from what uh, people are, are used to. We're trying a, a different, David wants to try a different format um, for, for this, uh, for SNS in this conversation. So what I'm going to do, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have short little pithy one minute, you know, statements or something like that of the positions. And then I guess I'm going to be in charge of asking some questions to coax some dialogue between David uh, P and David J. Um, but before we actually get into the argument um, from fine tuning, which is today's topic, uh, I think it's uh, appropriate to get to know the guest. Uh, David P., why, why don't you introduce us as to who you are, uh, maybe give us a, um, a notion of your faith journey and, and why you're interested in the argument from design? Yeah, uh, well... I mean, there's not a whole lot interesting about me. I'm a student in seminary at Trinity Theological Seminary. I run the YouTube Apologetics Ministry, Faith Because of Reason, uh, and I debate with Calvinists a lot. Uh, as far as, um, you know, why I'm interested in this topic, uh, I was raised in, like, a, a very narrow, young-earth creationist sort of denomination, uh, so... I was always taught it was a very important issue, the topic of evolution. Uh, as I studied it more, I kind of came to the conclusion that young earth creationism wasn't all that defensible. Uh, but I still saw some good reasons to be skeptical of at least full-blown neo-Darwinian evolution. And uh, so that's kind of what, what, why I remain interested in the design argument. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, yeah, well, welcome to the show. It's uh, it's interesting. I might uh, hit you up for some help because I've got I'm doing a debate with Chris Date on the issue of Calvinism. So, uh, yeah, maybe <laughs> give, you, give you some tips there. Um, I had one with him. Did you? Oh, it, if that's yeah, maybe send me the link. I'd love to to see that. Um, Did you? So, yeah. Win? Cool. I actually feel like he performed better, uh, but I also kind of felt like he sort of dominated the discussion and I didn't really get a chance to make my full case. So that was my, <laughs> that's my takeaway on it. Gotcha. All right. Perfect. All right. So, so let's, let's get straight into the uh, argument from design. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, as uh, David P is the one initiating, maybe, you know, just in a, a statement or two, um, what is the argument from design that you want to uh, talk to us about? Yeah, well, so first of all, it's not an argument for God's existence. I uh, just want to be clear on that. Um, but it is uh, just more or less the belief that there are certain features of the natural world that would be best explained by an intelligent cause, intelligent agency, as opposed to naturalistic processes. Uh, and that's there's kind of two parts to that. There's methodology, how we uh, detect design, and then there's uh, the question of empirical evidence for design. Uh, and there's a few different routes we go with that, but uh, my preferred one is uh, the argument from the information-bearing properties of DNA. Uh, if we come to the conclusion that uh, information is something that uh, only arises from intelligent uh, causation, then if we find intelligent, uh, or uh, then we have evidence for intelligent design from the information bearing properties of DNA. Okay, and yeah, uh, David, maybe just in a, a statement or two, what's your position on an argument from design? 
Well, you know, uh, David and I are on opposite poles, so he's willing to forego the theistic argument. I'm willing to forego the science argument. <laughs> so uh, I only care about the theistic and philosophical uh, arguments attached to it, and I'm perfectly willing to uh, grant uh, that it is uh, at least not logically impossible uh, that a first mover existed. So I don't, I don't, I don't actually care about that part of the argument at all. Although uh, I am prepared to talk about it um, to to some degree. I think that d- uh, design arguments, all teleological arguments, fail because they must assume some type of intended uh, purpose. And so, if you if you can't argue that, then I think your teleological argument fails. Um, no, no matter how you start it, it it's going to end badly. Okay. Okay. So, so one thing just to to get off the ground here. So, uh, David P, you're specifically focusing on uh, the, you know, sort of the creation versus evolution design, right? And that would need an intelligent design based on biology. Is that correct? It's not the fine tuning of the universe so much. Yeah, that that's where I've done more of my study is in the biological side. Uh, there's interesting stuff to study in you know physics and um, you know the placement of planets and things like that. But that's not so much been an area that I have dedicated a lot of study to. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so so I guess can, the, can I just so ask a clarifying question? Sure. Are, are you yeah, an right. expert in biology, uh, David? Or are you someone who took biology at a university and you know, or have no more greater expertise than anyone else who went to a four-year university. I'm definitely not an expert on it. Uh, what I study is theology, uh, but uh, I have, you know, studied it. Um, I would say I know the topic better than your average person, for you, sure. You went to um, Trinity, right? Correct, right, yeah. Okay, so, so it's you, not, it's, you, it's know, not you know biology from a perspective of someone who took it at a theological seminar. I didn't even take it there. It's it's really just been uh, kind of a hobby that I've studied on the side. Okay. Okay. Uh, so so what I would like to to ask you guys then. So so David kind of hinted in his opening statement. You know, the, there has to be this intended goal or te- telio. So um, yeah, di- uh, maybe starting with David P. Let's just start in general. So in general, how, how can we go about trying to identify design? And, and then I'll go to David and have you guys interact on, you know, how, how do we identify design in general? Which David was that that you wanted to start with? Uh, let's, let's start with you and then go to, to David and have some back and forth. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, um, one way, well, you know, let's go with what Darwin said, was that uh, the way to explain something from the past is to, uh, or the best way to explain something in the past or a uh, phenomena created in the past is by reference to something that's known to produce the same or similar effects in the present. And so if we uh, find something uh you know, uh, say like arrowheads or pottery shards or something of that nature, uh, you know, uh, like an archaeologist comes across that. Uh, I don't think, you know, it, it's too much of a stretch that you can say that these are items that were intelligently designed. And the reason for that is because from our own experience, we know that these are the specific types of effects that are caused by intelligent agents, whereas uh we know also from our experience that they are not the sort of effects that are caused by uh, natural processes. Yeah, uh, David, what are your thoughts on detecting design in general and, yeah. and maybe back on David's suggestion? I kind of disagree uh, that the only way to in- infer design uh, is by comparing it to something else that we know is designed in the, or David put it a little bit different way, which which made me want to disagree with it. Um, and the reason is because just because just because we've seen that thing designed by a person in the past doesn't mean that it also couldn't be designed by nature. So I, I think that what David is doing is saying, well, okay, we know that this is something that people have designed, and therefore it must be a person who designed it always. Uh, a, an example of this may be uh, the, the clockmaker uh, idea, 
which I think is a, a little bit flawed. We look, we see a clock and we see that it's intelligently designed. Uh, and so when we see other types of clocks in, in generic sense, we shouldn't think that that's also intelligently designed. Nature is full of clocks, uh, natural clocks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we we might see a Swiss mechanical uh, watch on a beach and think that that was intelligently designed, but um, you know chemical clocks that exist, um, or maybe uh, kind of bigger clocks, maybe produced by quasars or something like that, um, also exist. And we shouldn't infer that someone designed them just because a human designed a Swiss Swiss watch. Um, yeah, uh, David, Peter, f- feel free to to have a little back and forth. Okay. In in in, let me let me just very briefly uh, interact with a, an example that he did use an arrowhead, for instance. Uh, yes, okay. arrowheads uh, can be designed by humans, but they can also be designed by wind and and sand. You know, on the on the right type of rock in in the right location over a million years. <laughs> you know, so. Um, I just I don't I don't think you can come up with very many uh, of that type of simple design thing that points to only one way for it to have been designed. Yeah, there's there's kind of two issues there I would want to deal with. Uh, first of all, I'm not saying that you know this is the only possible explanation. So I do want to you know be careful to be modest in the claims that I'm making. So I wouldn't say because. The uh, so you know the specific argument that I would be using for intelligent design would be uh, from the information bearing properties of DNA. Uh, I wouldn't say that because we have information here and information is known to come from a mind. Therefore, that's the only possible explanation for the origin of the information in DNA. Uh, but I would say that it is the best explanation in that it is an explanation that has the causal adequacy. Uh, we know that intelligence has the capabilities to uh, make it, and then it's. Actually, uh, we can actually rule out other proposed um, other proposed explanations. And so, uh, while it could be that there is, you know, a third way that we don't know about, uh, since we don't know about it, that would leave intelligence as the best explanation. So, I'm not saying only possible explanation. I'm saying best explanation. And then uh, the second thing is, uh, so uh, for for example, with, when you were saying uh, when you're bringing up clocks, I'm not sure, you know, if there would be some equivocation there with. with uh, say like a chemical clock but um to some extent i feel like clocks are a bad example because clocks are made to mimic um things in nature clocks are at least as far as like time goes so uh if this effect is to keep time then it's trying to mimic things that already exist in nature and we do know that intelligence can mimic uh natural causes so i, I feel kind of like that is a bad example to go with if that makes sense sure it's it's an example that um, I, ID proponents tend to use, though. Um, so I just I just wanted to address it because it's you know, the, the the watchmaker example. It's it's out there uh, in in people's minds. So um, you're claiming that intelligent design is merely possible, and maybe more than that, the best explanation of the explanations we have is that is that correct? Yeah, I wouldn't say merely possible. I'd say it is possible and then uh, based on an absence of other uh, candidates having any having any you know evidence in favor of them, that would make it the best explanation. Okay, and you're you're mostly focused on the information in DNA. Correct. Okay. So um, yeah, I don't I don't know how much I want to pursue that <laughs> because Uh, One, I'm not a DNA expert, but two, you've already acknowledged that it's not necessarily you're not saying that it's the only possible way. Uh, And so I don't want to back you into the uh, corner of making an argument from ignorance. Uh, So I would just say, generically speaking, uh, I've heard you say in the past that uh, the only way we get information is from intelligence sources or you've, you've made arguments like that. And if you're not making that argument, then I don't know how much effort I want to put into that. So just an example, if you have a piece of uh, thin metal and, um, you know, it's on a beach and there's a windstorm and a particularly shaped rock hits that metal and and gets tumbled away, 
that metal has information from the rock. There's information that someone could look at. Um, and then, you know, there might be other information. That piece of metal then uh, gets blown and rips through, you know, some thin fabric thing. Well, that fabric has some information uh, in it that's uh, taken from the rock and the metal. Uh, information gets passed on without uh, it, it doesn't need some intelligent design uh, to just merely pass on, uh, you know, limited bits of information from one instantiation to another. So if since you're not making that case that the only way for us to get information is through an intelligent source, I don't see any reason why I should pursue that any further. Okay, so let me make two comments on that. Uh, the claim isn't necessarily that... Uh, intelligence is the only place that you can get information but rather it's that it's the only known source of where we can get information and that's why it is the best explanation if you could show another uh place that you can get information then uh, i think that would challenge the design argument that well, I'm I've, making. Just, I've just given you an, a, a, an example of how information can get passed on through non-intelligent sources Correct, and that, and that was what I wanted to address next. But I, I did want to uh, have, you know, kind of how the, the the argument is framed there. Uh, as far as you know, your uh, example of whether a rock, uh, you know, hits a piece of metal and leaves an imprint in, in, in that uh, information, it seems like you're kind of operating on Shannon information theory. Would that be correct? I have no idea what that term means. So uh, okay, you tell so. Me. Uh, <laughs> Shan Shannon information theory is, is basically uh, it works on the premise that. Um, so information is basically a lack of, uh, or I'm sorry, not a lack of, it's a reduction of uncertainty. So, um, you know, uh, this would kind of be the information theory that you would apply to uh, if you take a, you know, a block of granite or, or as opposed to a, a bust of Abraham Lincoln that's been carved out of it. Uh, the amount of uncertainty has been reduced because you've had, you know, some of the uh, granite removed from it. And so now you've got something that starts looking designed. And so that, that's kind of how Shannon information theory works. Um, and my issue with Shannon information theory is that uh, it's inadequate because you can have a line of uh, like 10 characters that don't mean anything. And you can have a line of 10 characters that's expressing a meaningful sentence. And according to Shannon information theory, these are both expressing an equal amount of information. And that that seems, you know, that seems self-evidently to be wrong to me. Uh, a sentence that has a meaning to it is obviously conveying information, whereas a, a rambling line of text is not. So uh, maybe it would help if I defined kind of information, how I'm understanding it here. Which sure. that You're going to have to do better than that because uh, so far everything that I've said and some of what you said, it sounds like rambling lines of information. Uh, so just because information could be uh, more clear, we could have better information as systems evolve. Doesn't mean that we don't have any information transmitted, even with uh, jumbled lines of text. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, David P. That that's a good question. That is sort of maybe get into well, what what is the specific info, quote unquote information in the DNA that we're talking about, and how is that differentiated in, in this case? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the way that I uh, understand information, or what I think the best proposed definition would be, uh, alternative sequences of something, you know, characters, letters, whatever, that gives rise to a specific function. So um, when uh, so so that's kind of that that would be uh, kind of how our uh, letters in a book or. Um, generally how we think about information, but that can also be like binary code. Uh, so w as that applies to biology uh, in DNA is you've got, uh, well, everyone knows what the, the double helix looks like. Uh, you've got four different uh, types of nucleotide bases and uh, they connect to the backbone of the double, of the double helix and uh, the particular arrangement of them is what gives rise to biological function. So that's how, uh, you know, new proteins and stuff get uh, built and sequenced and uh, that's how our bodies are able to, well, get built in the first place and then to sustain themselves is based on this, uh, it's effectively a form of digital code, is these, uh, these four four different types of nucleotide bases and how they're sequenced. So it, it really is, it functions exactly the way that uh, letters do in a book. 
Gotcha. Yeah. So, so David, uh, maybe coming back on that. Um, so one thing he mentioned is that it provides this certain function. And one thing that you mentioned in your first uh, speech is, well, there, there has to be this intended telio. So uh, isn't what David P. is saying that, that the information in DNA serves to to do this or that certain function? Wouldn't that be a specification of sorts? Why or why not? And go back and forth on that. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. Um I, I think that you, so if I, my limited knowledge of information theory uh, is that something like a DNA chain starts out very simplistically, extremely simplistically, uh, and it grows um, from there. And so I, I wouldn't start by trying to understand uh, DNA as it is now. Uh, I would want to go back and look at the simplest uh form uh of life you know amino acids or something like that um and then and then begin to build a picture on how information uh developed and grew and was passed on and mutated and so forth now speaking of mutations sure um we we have useful information in dna code but we also have um uh, information uh, that doesn't function quite so well unless you say that cancer is also um, an important uh, message from from DNA. Uh, there, there is lots of the DNA code that leads to some pretty bad things, and so I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if you're saying that DNA, uh, that the fact that we have functioning humans is evidence that it had intention to be that way, or um, so I'm not sure what the claim would be. I mean, we are here; that's true. And we have DNA that functions, that's true. But we also have monstrosities of human beings that are here. Um, and so I don't, I'm not entirely sure what, what claim I'm um, working against at, uh, with that question. So, I mean, David, maybe you, can, maybe you can take what I'm saying and kind of express, uh, express what, what you're saying better. Well, yeah. So, you know, an objection from, uh, say, like junk DNA or uh, even worse, uh, our, our argument like you're making from uh, DNA that's actually harmful. Uh, so you know, the theory of intelligent design certainly will allow for there to be uh, you know, mistakes that uh, happen along the way, uh, just as uh, would happen in, uh, say, a computer software program. Uh, you could have, uh, you know, uh, as information gets copied, it can get copied wrong, so mistakes can happen. So I'm not by any means arguing that every single piece of DNA has to be uh, functional. I'm specifically, you know, arguing that the origin of it needs to be uh, needs to be intelligently designed in order for you to get the uh, information that can get corrupted into mutations, that can get corrupted into uh, cancer. Uh, honestly, I'm not quite sure how cancer works, but I do believe that there has to be that, that genetic uh, mistake that happens there in order to get it. Uh, so, you know, I, I will agree with you that there are uh, these sorts of harmful uh, functions that can be performed by uh, DNA, but uh, these would seem to be evidence of corrosion on a, a design system, at least in my view. Okay, so um, I want I want to get some clarification um, before we move on. What are you since since intelligent design um, and fine tuning these arguments? I, I think they all depend in teleology. They all depend on an intelligence having intention two forms of intention one they in they intentionally did the design it wasn't something by accident and two they had an intentional uh, an intention for what it was supposed to be uh so the, these are kind of my criteria uh, uh so what do you think the intention was for design and i know you say you're not a you're, you're not in on the physicist side of things. I mean, I'm not either. I'm not even on the biology th side of things. But I, I think that we've got to start with the physics of the universe. Um, and, you know, before we even get to the question of biology and DNA, and if it was all designed by an intelligent designer, what do you think the goal was? Okay, well, I, I do think that that's 
kind of not the best way to assess these sorts of questions. So let me just say that there, I have a kind of an in principle objection to uh, opposing questions about teleology from the perspective of what's the purpose of it. Uh, so I'll give an answer that I think, you know, obviously in my own belief is that the purpose of the design is to uh, make possible life. But um, I, I don't know that, you know, that is really the best sort of way to frame the issue. Uh, as I've expressed, I think it's much better to look at the sorts of effects that are produced by intelligent agents and then uh, see if we have these same sorts of effects in uh, nature. Okay, but I'm I'm pretty much done with the pursuit of um, trying to determine whether someone designed. A, we we're never going to figure that out. Even if you were a physicist, a biologist, and I was a physicist, we wouldn't solve that. But I'm willing to grant, for the sake of argument, to just advance advance it to the next uh, level to kind of understand what the Christian's point of this argument is. Uh, let's let's assume that there was a first mover of some sort what what after that i mean you're you're saying it must be designed and we're trying to differentiate design from non-design and i've i've given kind of my rough criteria which is intentionality um and so yeah you can say well this looks like it was intentionally designed but that's only one part of it it also has to have a it a purpose or an end goal and if you don't have that part of it, then I'm not sure where your argument goes. Could I ask how you uh, are able to detect intentionality? Uh, I'm not really able to detect in intentionality because ultimately, I don't. I don't think that we can detect design in the way the ID uh, proponents uh, say they can. But I mean, one of the ways that I can in detect intentionality. Uh, is, say, a, a book. I like to read books. Uh, if I see a book and an author uh, leaves a note saying, I wrote this book for this purpose, well, we've got some intentionality there. Um, but if I, you know, if I see a, let's say, a rock formation uh, on a beach, and it looks like someone stacked those rocks, I actually cannot tell whether someone stacked those rocks or whether they were... Uh, or they're just by natural happenstance. I don't, I don't have a way of detecting intentionality uh, in that case. Okay. What if it's like Stonehenge, though? Do you think you can detect, you know, do you think that uh, people actually, um, you know, put the stones in those particular formations? Or uh, is that more probable based on our experience I of, you know, what we know? I couldn't say. Sorry? I couldn't say. I've seen okay. all kinds of improbable things uh, formed out of nature. Uh, okay. So, yeah, that's the, the Earth. Never mind the fourteen near fourteen billion years the universe has been here. The Earth has been here for uh, what four point five billion of those years. Uh, that's a long time for stuff to happen. <laughs> so, uh, I can't. I can't tell. Let, let me ask yeah. this. That might be. Oh, sorry, Dave. Yeah, go ahead, David. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Uh, I would say uh, I could go back to, you know, your book example. Uh, so it seems that you and me both agree that there is, at least at some level, a way to detect design in some cases, right? I, I think you can detect it in um, Stonehenge, but, you know, you seem skeptical of that. But you did agree that we could detect it in a book. Um, and your reason for that was if the author says that they wrote the book. Um, now, that actually corresponds... You know, somewhat well to my uh, to my DNA analogy that, or, or not analogy, but my DNA argument that I'm making here, uh, in that um, you know I think a book is designed, and the reason why is because a book exhibits features that are only known to come from intelligent minds. Uh, most obviously, that it's communicating meaningful information. Uh, so that is you know the same sort of argument that I would make uh, for uh, for intelligent design in biology. Okay, but well, that's fine. I think it's too generic, though. I mean, lots of things convey meaningful information that are very simple. Um, you know, uh, I think if you see the bones of a human being at the mouth of a cave, the the meaningful information might be that a wild animal uh, habitates that cave. <laughs> you should probably not go in there for shelter. That's meaningful information too. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, there are lots of me ways of, of conveying meaningful information that do not necessarily come from what you would think of as intelligence. And before, before I let Dale step back in, I just want to cut through some of the noise and ask a question that I've always wanted to ask an ID person. Uh, my assumption is you believe that everything is designed. So I, I think it's somewhat... Um, so I, I don't dishonest is not disingenuous maybe uh, to even talk about design if what you think is that everything is designed. So can you can you come in on that? For you, is yeah. is there anything that's not designed? Yeah, I'll make two points in there. First, even if I, uh, even if it was my belief that everything was intelligently designed, uh, that would not negate specific arguments that I'm making for something within nature that I can you know prove is designed or give good evidence for design as opposed to say something that I couldn't. Uh, but I actually would even want to push back on I don't believe that everything is designed, certainly not in the same way. So, uh, you know, and this is going to get a bit into my theology here, but as a Christian theist, so I believe that God put natural uh, laws into effect. And so that these natural laws, natural processes, these, you know, do have the ability to bring about things, which, you know, while they are the... Um, result of an intelligent mind, they aren't creating effects that uh, show evidence of uh, intelligence. Whereas I don't believe something like DNA came about through a natural process. I think that this is something that was uh, specifically, uh, you know, indirectly uh, created by, I'll just say, an intelligent designer here. So uh, I hope so, that kind so of... So can you give me an example of something you think is not designed? Yeah, like a uh, rock or something, rock formation that is... Um, made through uh, a sandstorm, say, with the, the, the uh, wind just kind of blows the sand and it fashions uh, the rock in a particular shape. I, I wouldn't consider that intelligently designed. Okay, would you consider the rock designed? Uh, no, I probably it came about through, um, you know, however many years of uh, earthquakes and uh, volcanoes erupting and... Uh, I'm honestly not an expert in geology, but um, there's a lot of different ways that uh, rocks take their shape and stuff. So, so I think, uh, da David, so I, I think what David P is, is saying is that there, there are different types of design and some are detectable in different ways. So uh, do you recognize that point when it comes to God's providence? Maybe everything is designed in a certain sense that we can't prove in the same way that we can prove other types of designs on a more localized level. Do, do you recognize that distinction or is that... Not yeah, really. I'm trying to drill down to a point where uh, where I can recognize because it sounds, it sounds kind of arbitrary. This thing that I care about is designed, but that thing that I don't care about, maybe it's not designed. Uh, it sounds like what the argument is saying, and I'm just trying to understand the distinction between the things he thinks is designed versus the things he thinks are not designed it would come uh, i think the distinction would come down to uh while or well how the thing comes about uh or where it traces its origin to does it trace its origin to a natural process or does it trace its origin to a uh, intelligent mind all right. So, so David, one one thing that I think could help uh, in what we're discussing about, uh, just to throw it out there, what do you make of William Dembski's specified complexity as a as a set of general criteria? Do you, do you think that can be helpful in detecting design in, in DNA and that sort of stuff? Yeah, Dembski has what he calls an explanatory filter, and let's see, it's been a few years since I've read Dembski's work, uh, but it has basically three criteria, and I think they are that it has to be, something has to be contingent, it has to be uh, complex, and it has to be specified, and if something meets those three criteria, then he uh, says that we can appropriately um, say that it is designed. Uh, I think it works. There is a lot of criticism of it, but um, the thing that I never see, that I've never read in the criticisms of Dembski's, uh, Dembski's criteria is I've never heard a superior criteria offered. So people like, are happy to criticize Dembski, but then but, but they still believe that we can detect design, but then they don't want to tell us how. So I think if somebody is, wants to offer a serious criticism of Dembski's um, 
criteria and they're welcome to try i don't obviously have a problem with that but if you do then i think you need to uh you know also do the work of offering us a superior alternative of if you think that we can detect design how do we detect it okay so i think that this is partly dependent on what kind of christian we're talking to uh because uh many would say the rock is designed uh that would their at least their theology would lead to that ultimate conclusion because if that rock is there and it tumbled into a certain place and it caused someone to stub their toe and trip and fall, um, you know, maybe God wanted that person to trip and fall at that particular time because it saved them from some other disaster that was coming their way if they hadn't tripped and fallen. So he made the perfect rock to be uh, placed in the perfect location to bring about his will. That rock would be highly designed if they if they believe a God uh, who does those sorts of things. Uh, and so once again, it's it's a matter of, well, if you think that some things are undesigned, I'm trying to get a sense of what that is uh, so that, you know, we we don't if we get into a theistic conversation, turn around and end up with a God that necessitates that everything is actually designed. Because I think that that's where the ultimate logic of design goes. Everything has to be designed if you're leading to the God of the Bible. Yeah, and, and maybe it would be helpful to make a distinction here between everything being created and then, you know, within that, everything being designed, right? Uh, maybe you think of it this way. If we think of a factory or something that, uh, you know, makes Play-Doh, uh, and you just got this kind of big blob of Play-Doh, and then within that Play-Doh, then, uh, you know, you could have the, maybe, you know, the person just likes Play-Doh, and they make, like, a lot of little, um, you know, little towers and little people and things like that. These are the kind of things that we would be uh, discussing as designed, as opposed to, you know, kind of the whole blob, or just kind of like this happenstance lump, lump of uh, Play-Doh or something sitting over in the corner that uh, the designer didn't, you know, choose to mold any specific way uh, so you know i think maybe that it's helpful if we think of it in kind of that way from a theistic perspective and remember i'm not necessarily arguing for theism so you know for the purpose of this discussion i could be fine with like the whole universe just popped into existence out of nothing completely you know unguided and uh however we got intelligence that's what designed life that you know would be compatible with the argument i'm making as well Sure. Okay. Well, I just think that's not enough argument to care about then, <laughs> because if it's if it doesn't go into uh, if it doesn't have a theistic component to it, uh, then we're just discussing science, and neither one of us are scientists. Uh, the scientists, however, have discussed uh, this to the degree that science is concerned about this sort of thing, and um, ID scientists don't tend to have a lot of respect uh, in the greater. Uh, field of uh, biological uh, and uh, physics scientists. So, you know, if if that's the discussion that we want to have, I think we have to sit back and let the experts have it. But if if we're talking about something that's vital in a in a theological kind of way, then I think that you have to advance your argument to something that is relevant to theology. And um, so. That's that's kind of where I am there. So I'll let David P come back to, to that objection uh, that it, you know it, it's just not relevant if we get an intelligent designer. It doesn't go far enough. But uh, after you answer that, I, I would also like to start asking you, David, what are some of the the alternative explanations that uh, need to be addressed? So you know, typically in, in teleological arguments, there's either physical necessity, so some kind of natural mechanism or law. Um, what was the option of chance? So I'd like you to, to address those and why those might not work, and we can have some back and forth on that. So, yeah, go ahead, dude. Yeah, answer David Jay's question about the relevance of uh, let's pretend the intelligent designer is an alien or something. It is there. Yeah. So, so maybe, you know, this is kind of like where I like to start with methodology. Um, and, you know, I certainly don't want to insult you, David, but um, it, it sounds to me because, you know, you had the same kind of objection in your debate with Evan. Uh, it sounds to me like perhaps, you know, you don't understand exactly how, you know, we do natural theology, which is that we uh, will establish different uh 
facts about reality. And then uh, we bring that together in a cumulative case that says, uh, well, and when do you apply Occam's razor, obviously, so that, you know, you're not, they're not all being explained by, you know, an independent cause. If you bring Occam's razor to that, then you say, from all of this, you get God or a God-like being, uh, you know, with the exception of the ontological argument, of course, uh, which is its own gumbo. Uh, so, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, building a case for every single piece of that, but I do think, you know, if we can establish that life has intelligence as its cause, then I think that there definitely are, uh, I would say that's at least friendly towards theism. I don't think, you know, you could say that there's absolutely no, um, no theistic implications from that or no way that that would be favorable towards theism as opposed to naturalism. Do you want him to push back on that before I go into other explanations? Uh, did, David, it's your show. Did, did you want to push back on that? Because I know that's, well, if it's actually, important. Actually, Dale, it's your show uh, today. But, um, yeah, look, okay. I, I don't, it's not so much a matter of pushback. I, I just, um, I think if you want to make a generic statement uh, about, you know, you think that there was an intelligent first mover and you want to base it on deep science, deep biology, deep physics, then you need to have deep science, biology, physics, uh people to discuss it uh and we have that and the so far the scientific community does not agree with that uh so i'm not i'm not uh i'm not sure why you believe that you can overturn that here on on the level that you and i are at uh we can discuss things like theology and and uh you know armchair philosophy um, and see see if those ideas work on a on a common level. But if you want to build a bridge to God through an accumulative case, you haven't really gotten started just by um, just by laying the foundation that there might be have, have been some kind of intelligent first mover. Uh, I say this a lot, and it probably makes my audience cringe. I'm not opposed to the idea of an intelligent first mover. <laughs> it does not matter to me. It does not. It does not have one bearing at all on my objection to the uh, existence of the Christian God. Uh, so you still have all of your work in front of you there, and if you want to do some of that work, uh, feel free to do it. But you haven't. You haven't done it yet. Oh, I mean, I get that. If you know you, if you agree, and I'm not sure, if, uh, it didn't sound like you were agreeing to this, but you know, if a person agrees that you know there is uh, an intelligent designer for life, then you know my my case is made as far as uh, this particular argument goes. That's all I seek to establish through it. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think your case is made. It's just that your case isn't. I don't see your case worth trying to defeat because <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't say anything. Uh, for the skeptic or the seeker uh, as to whether Yahweh uh, exists and should be uh, worshipped and so forth, I don't. I don't think it really makes any headway there. Yeah, I, I think it's. Yeah, I, I do think it's important um, to first let let's establish because there's there's skeptics in David's audience, uh, and you know who you are uh, that are screaming. You know, Darren. why are we seeing that there is an intelligent designer? There could be other naturalistic uh, explanations like through physical necessity or through change. So why don't we start addressing what, what are the main alternatives to the design inference or the design hypothesis and, and how do we know that design really is the best explanation compared to those? Yeah, sure. Uh, so kind of there's three main issues, well, maybe, maybe four that come up in this debate uh, when I make this sort of argument and when people when people who take a position very different from uh, David Jay's here, who, who do, you know, see intelligent design as uh, having theistic implications, will kind of give me pushback in one of four ways. They'll sometimes be uh, talking about the miller ure experiment uh, back in the, the 1960s, I want to say it was, uh, which uh, basically showed how you can get amino acids uh, through... Um, through a naturalistic process. And they say, well, look, doesn't this uh, give us some evidence that you can get uh, life naturalistically? Uh, you know, some issues with that are that uh, we now know that Miller Ure was operating on, you know, flawed assumptions about what the atmosphere of the early Earth looked like. Uh, and uh, more importantly, he did not get uh, DNA in any sense. He got amino acids, which are the building blocks from life, but my argument can grant that. I I'm interested in how they get arranged into a uh, meaningful, into meaningful sequences. Uh, another one would be um, 
the RNA world. That's a very popular one these days. Uh, and so, you know, they'll say, well, you know, it's too difficult to get DNA directly from natural process. So uh, RNA is a little simpler. Maybe we can get it from there. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just uh, there, there's a lot of problems with the RNA world hypothesis. So, uh, first of all, you know, building blocks are very difficult to synthesize. They're easy to destroy uh, before RNA could really be um, before you could have RNA. Uh, you need these smaller constituent molecules that have to form. Uh, and it's nearly impossible for those building blocks to be th synthesized and maintained under like realistic prebiotic conditions. Uh, any experiments we have that have successfully achieved that synthesis have only succeeded due to intelligent interference on the part of scientists. Uh, ribozymes are really, really bad poor substitutes for proteins. Uh, RNA molecules possess, you know, just very few of the enzymatic properties of a protein. Uh, and more, more importantly, uh, the RNA world just does not explain how... Um, you get the sequences of information. It really runs into the same problem as the DNA uh, problem is that you still have to explain how you get the meaningful sequences of, uh, well, you know, whether you think it's ribozymes instead of proteins, whatever it is, the information bearing properties here are not being explained. Uh, Self-organization, that's popular these days. Uh, there's just there's two problems with self-organization and uh, problems with, and I'm sorry, I'm rambling here, but... Um, oh, the, the, the two problems with self-organization is, first of all, we don't have empirical evidence that you can get anything like DNA to uh, self-assemble. So it's kind of just uh, throwing it out there. It's like, hey, what about this without giving any hard evidence? And then uh, second, um, there's an in-principle objection, and that's just from what we know about self-organization processes in nature, is that they produce uh, periodic patterns, but information by the very nature of what it is is just the opposite. It's aperiodic. Uh, so it, it is really, it's kind of essentially asserting a contradiction to say that something that we know only produces periodic sequences can be invoked to explain aperiodic sequences. Uh, and I think this actually really gets back to even David's objection here, where he said that, you know, we know scientists, they don't buy these explanations. Well, that may be true, but here's the thing they don't have an explanation for the origin of life. They don't have an explanation for the origin of DNA. And this is pretty well admitted across the board among scientists. So, uh, you know, uh, that, that's not offering a superior explanation to the one that I'm offering, which would be intelligent design. So maybe they're not buying this explanation, but they haven't given a better one. And my argument is that intelligent design is the best explanation of the origin of uh, the information bearing properties of DNA. Okay, we, we, don't, we don't need to give a counter explanation. <laughs> so first of all, it, if you have a, a, a question and no one has an answer to it, and then someone raises their hand and offers an answer, it doesn't mean that their answer is the best explanation. It, so, it, yeah, it, that, are you that is just that is just a false that is a false premise that um, you have the best explanation because uh, the science world uh, does not have a full explanation. It's it's it says it's it's faulty on its on its premise. So, David, just to quick clear before I let David P come back on the exchange of that. So, just to clarify, so do you, are you um, positing? Do you think that naturalistic naturalistic explanations, even if we don't know or have a specific hypothesis that works, the naturalism is on par with the the, the normal natural explanation on par with an intelligent design hypothesis, or do you? Do you see them as even better or superior to that? Well, so I, I don't I don't know what the natural explanations would be, but I mean when you say natural explanation, I just hear explanation <laughs> because because it's natural. And so whenever you're positing uh, the supernatural, that's where your explanations have to be really solid because um, so I don't I I don't know any situations where a supernatural explanation is better than actual explanations. <laughs> so I shouldn't say supernatural. Natural, uh, right. Yeah, like the, the physical necessity or the chance explanations are on par with the design. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's okay to say natural explanation. I'm just saying you're 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 saying that as if there was an alternative to nature. 
And that's that's even more out there than a bad natural explanation. Um, so I, what I would mostly challenge out of what uh, David has suggested is that we ha- a that we have to have an explanation. We don't. So there's no race to an explanation. I don't care what the origin of life is. I'm not going to know in my lifetime. I'm pretty sure. It doesn't matter. Uh, David has a supernatural explanation for the origin of life. That doesn't make it a better explanation simply because he's the only one throwing stuff at the wall. Um, so I, I find his explanation to be um, maybe born out of the necessity uh, to to promote his particular theistic framework. Uh, and if he did not have that necessity, then he wouldn't see the need to have an explanation for this at all. Certainly, there would n- not be a rush to an explanation. All right, Dave. Yeah, Dave, we'll go ahead and have the your intro back. Yeah, I mean, I'll make a couple of points on that. So, <clears throat> first of all, uh, you know, you're right that you don't need to have an explanation if you don't have an available one. So, you know, if we don't have any, you know, uh, explanation for some phenomena, obviously an explanation is not best just because it's been suggested. And uh, I'm not saying that it is. I-, I would say that intelligence is the best explanation precisely because we know. Uh, that uh, information can be produced by intelligent minds. So uh, it would be, you know, a total argument from ignorance, a god of the gaps, if you will, if I said, uh, well, we don't know what caused the information in DNA, so God did it, so an intelligent designer did it. Uh, So that would be a fallacious argument. But my argument is because we do know that intelligence has the causal adequacy to account for information, it becomes the best explanation for the facts. Now We also know know that that nature has the causal adequacy uh, to start information off too. So you're, you're saying that the intelligence is a better explanation. And I'm not sure how you determine that. Um, because the, the thing that it would have required to kick off the very basic uh, function of DNA would have been very simple. And I don't, I don't see any reason why that could not have been a natural process. Uh, so once again, I, I you know, we can say that your intelligent designer is on the table as a possibility, but I don't see how you get him, you know, as the best explanation. What natural process or what natural explanation are you thinking of that uh, can explain information of the sort that we see in DNA? Well, maybe the better question is what sort of information do we see in A that you think cannot be explained by nature? And before David um, answers that, I, I just wanted to clarify. So I, I screwed. I screwed up um, when I, I compared intelligent design. <clears throat> intelligent design can be a naturalistic explanation. Intelligent design is natural. I mean, books and stuff like that. So it, it shouldn't be about supernatural versus natural. The, the intelligent designer of DNA could be an alien, which is, which is natural. And that, so that was my fault. But yeah, yeah it, and if it, I it, if I could just join in on that, Dale, I'm not I'm not blaming you for any confusion here. I I have uh, often used the Q uh, in Star Trek example. Um, I have no problem with the idea of some super being uh, in some other ex- instantiation of a universe uh, working in their lab and creating a universe. Um, I don't think that's what happened, but I think it's more likely than the than the Christian answer. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I don't I don't see anything that's logically impossible about it. I don't see anything that's logically impossible about us one day forming intentionally forming a universe uh, in a lab uh, that wouldn't make us gods. Uh, so uh, you know the, that that sort of thing just doesn't trouble me at all. And I, I don't spend a lot of my uh, waking hours worried about um, the implications of, you know, some kind of intelligent designer. That's that's just not any part of my, you know, the theology that I left behind. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry to, to interrupt. I just wanted to clarify that that was my my sort of mistake there. But yeah, did did carry on with um, the conversation with David there. No, that's an excellent point, which was the other thing I was going to raise, is that, uh, sorry, you had both uh, said 
I was positing a supernatural explanation, and I most certainly am not. I'm uh, positing an intelligent explanation, which I do think, you know, it is uh, may produce effects that are uh, qualitatively different than uh, just naturalistic processes. So, uh, you know, uh, there is a distinction there, but the natural to supernatural would not be the correct distinction to make. But I do appreciate you pointing that out, Dale. Uh, now, the question that you had asked is how was I understanding information in DNA? And I believe I had defined that as alternative sequences of uh, specific, you know, characters or letters or uh, whatever that will give rise to a specific effect. So where do you see that ever coming about from a natural process? So I don't know. I'm, I'm unqualified to answer that. I've read a lot um, in the run-up to this and uh, over the course of my life on biology and DNA um, and information theory. I don't feel really qualified to repeat any of that. <laughs> you know, I can, I can go through some notes and just read what scientists have said. But I, I'm going to leave... I think most of that to the commenters, uh, that, uh, both Christian and non-Christian in the audience, that are very scientifically minded. I think that they uh, will be able to deal with that just fine. If you really want to have that science debate, uh, we, I think, I think I can probably get you uh, set up with Skydive Phil or, or someone like that. He's more uh, physics uh, than biology, I think. Uh, but I, I think that we could, you know, we can get you set up with some actual practicing biologists if that if that's the discussion you really want to have. Um, well, I mean, but, but I, I don't. I say, you know, go ahead. Yeah, but so, but I don't. I don't think that that really is the heart of the argument from design as as it's as it's commonly had. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad that you made made some clarification in that. And uh, if you stick around this week in the comment section, you might be able to um, argue that out with some of the people who are a little bit more prepared to argue that than I am. Yeah, yeah, that, you know that's fine. Um, Science is pretty well established at at this point, and they don't seem to be leaning in the direction that you're you're leaning in. So. Um, the point, though, that, you know, I don't really think it is a scientific debate, uh, you know, that much, really, at the end of the day, in that scientists are also pretty well agreed that we don't know how life began. Um, you know, we have leading uh, origin of life researchers who like to say that we have made no progress in this field whatsoever, that, you know, we have no idea. Uh, and so if, you know, it's been established that, um, you know, that there actually isn't um, a natural explanation naturalistic explanation uh you know that's that's really the only point i would make that's when the science you know comes into it when people you know try to propose other explanations like rna world or something like that then you know that's when you have the science debates but i mean at the end of the day it doesn't really seem like it's that much of a scientific debate if we come to the conclusion that science just doesn't know then it's a simple matter of can intelligence account for the effect in question? And the answer is yes. And so if we don't have another explanation, it just, it, it seems very, at least clear to me that that, you know, becomes the best explanation. Then the you fact. have to, you have to posit something more specific about your intelligence. And I, I think this is the, the debate that you're trying very hard not to have. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure why. I mean, it's not, you, you're not just saying that it's intelligence behind it. You're saying that's a very specific intelligence. And so if you're saying, there's an intelligence behind the creation of the universe, then you are, I think, making a particular kind of theistic statement. Um, uh, you, are, you are making an argument for a god and your god. And so I would like to see if we can't progress the discussion to where you really are in your thinking, uh, as opposed to you know, generic oatmeal about origins of the universe. That, that's a good question, just to sort of broaden that. So, so sort of related, you, you hear the tip, you know, Doc, who, who designed the designer, that sort of thing. But sort of generalizing with what David's saying and, and that kind of objection, um, what, what is it uh, exactly that in order for us to infer design or intelligent design, uh, what all do we need to know? Like, do, do we need to know who designed the designer? Do we need to know all the attributes of, of this designer? Or like, what, what sort of things are, are essential for us to make that inference? It is, 
simple intelligence enough and that sort of thing. So, uh, what, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good, uh, you know, good place to start is that if we have an intelligent uh, cause as the explanation, uh, on the one hand, I disagree with uh, David J that, you know, I have to be able to, you know, defend more than that. I, I think that that's, you know, uh, no, no offense, but I think that would be an absolutely ridiculous stipulation, you know, to say in any scientific study, oh, well, you know, you can't just propose a basic explanation. You have to, you know, have be more specific than that. It's great if we can get more specific than that, but I, I wouldn't say that that's necessary. Uh, and I forgot where I was going with that train of thought, but, um, well, let, yeah, let that, me just jump in and say, you do, you, you can stop trying to not offend me. This is skeptics and seekers. <laughs> Offense is a given. Uh, your, your point might be better taken by uh, Christians if you were just a little more offensive. <laughs> so I, I, I think you're being too generic. Um, and giving up too much ground. Um, and I am trying to open the door as wide as I can um, to have you say what you really think. Yeah, well, it, it sounds to me kind of like you would want to have the discussion, um, you know, are there theistic implications to intelligent design, not so much as, uh, you know, is intelligent design true? And I think that is a good conversation to have but you know as i would concede from the beginning i do not think you can get theism out of um out of intelligent design and so you know when you say that you know as a christian i hold much more than uh i hold too much more than just this you're absolutely right uh, but it's for other reasons and so you know we would have to have whole discussions about you know the beginning of the universe and the resurrection of christ and the uh, reliability of the new testament all of these are you know like important links in the chain of you know how i get to where i do uh this is just one of those links so look on your so, show David Jay, i, I want to ask i want to ask you a question because i mm -hmm. think it's important here so uh apart from the theistic stuff ju just making an, an inference to an intelligent designer what do you think is necessary so you know let's say that book that you were talking about what what do you need to know about the author of that book in order to warrant a, an intelligent design influence why, why isn't detecting intelligent input enough what else would you need about that designer to, to make that influence well you know i think there are other questions that um we would uh, uh, asked rather than just seeing a generic book there. I mean, the book might be, for instance, uh, the recipe uh, to, uh, you know, chicken soup that will cause you to live forever. Uh, and so I think that it is kind of important that we know something about the one who wrote the book. Uh, how would you know? Uh, it's a natural question. Well, we, let's let's learn something about the one who wrote the book. Maybe... Uh, the one who wrote the book uh, has lived forever, <laughs> you know, um, you know, th this is this is important information. Uh, how do we know that the claims in the book are even possible? Um, you know, how do we know that this isn't just gibberish? And if we follow this recipe, that it might be something that kills us. Uh, so I think if you're going to take the book seriously as something that was uh intelligently well designed uh it you do need to know something about the one who who put it there uh because otherwise you couldn't trust it so i think it's kind of a trivial claim to say well uh this book was designed by somebody therefore we should make this recipe and and eat this soup um that's too trivial a claim to take that leap and so, yeah, you, you really have to get into the real discussion uh, around the one who wrote the book and why you think it's uh, actually designed well. I just want to note that when I was on uh, Apostasize and... Uh, uh, call it PRA. Apostasize. When I was on the Apostasy Show, um, I, gave, I gave up the cosmological argument right up front. Uh, I just said, yeah, grant that. What's next? Um, to kind of see where we go, because if you grant the cosmological argument, the Kalam, at least as written, you don't get to your God. And this seems like a similar type of audio, uh, argument. If I grant that as, as given, we still don't get anywhere. And this is true with so much of Christian apologetics. And so Christians really, if they're going to be good apologists, need to take the next step and connect the dots uh, as to why this argument is important. Otherwise, it's not important. 
Gotcha. Yeah, and before I let David P come back, I, I just wanted to clarify that. So so thank you for your answer. You you do think that there are some additional details that are necessary, but at least for, for the audience, there are limits. You don't need to know everything about this design. You don't need to know the color of my eyes if that's not relevant to the to the content in the book or something like right. that. So, um, unless there's something in the book that says only blue-eyed people uh, who take this recipe will live forever, uh, then that might matter. Uh but to say that we don't need to know anything about the author um, yeah. is is to take the claim too trivially. All right, cool. Yeah, David P., I, I want to turn it to you. What, what do you make of David's notion that we need to at least know some things about the designer? Is, is that... Uh, this, this seems to, you know, be a, a question to seek the identity of the designer. And, uh, you know, that, that that's important, obviously. Uh, you know, <laughs> as, a, as a Christian, I'm not going to discourage that. But uh, I do think it goes beyond the limits of what you can establish scientifically. So scientifically, uh, you know, we we figure out what's and how's and things like that. But we don't figure out who's. These are uh, th that's uh, th those are just questions that science uh, is not uh, geared towards finding the answers to. So you know, wh while I agree those sorts of questions are interesting, even important, especially uh, you know if we're talking about these kind of bigger worldview matters, I don't think you're going to get the answers from the theory of intelligent design. I think okay. theory of intelligent design will get you to that there is an intelligent designer, but uh, that you're going to have to look into other fields if you want to you know figure out more about the designer. Fine, yeah, then the let's, let's go to the next question of why, because this is also one of the things that teleological arguments try to answer, the, the why, as if there was a why. So if you say that there is an intelligent designer who designed DNA, uh, take once again, I'm, I'm begging you, I'm leaving the door open for you, uh, leaving Christians in the audience screaming for you to take the next step. Uh, if, if you think that it was intelligently designed to convey information, why? Uh, what is your claim about the, the, the design uh, here? It, surely it's more than just the trivial, uh, but it seems designed. Why? Why would a designer do that? Why would a designer design DNA? Is that the question? Yeah. If, that, if that's where your focus on design is, uh, then tell me why a designer would design it. Uh, for the function of having living uh, biological beings that have bodies that function. Okay, so humans would be the focus of the design of the universe for you then? Not even just humans. It would be all living beings, all okay. forms of life, so uh, all... or all forms of biological life. Okay, depends so on the, universe. the universe is made for all forms of biological life then. Is that is that your position? Uh, no, that's not my position, but I also don't think that the theory of intelligent design can tell you one way or the other. Okay, so you have some theories on why, but you would have to go outside of intelligent de design to talk about those theories. There are questions that are just beyond the purview of science, and since okay. I primarily view intelligent design as a scientific theory, it's not going to be so intelligent can I, design. So I can, can I get you to uh, tell me why you personally, outside of the bounds of intelligent design, uh, think that uh, we were created? Why biological life was uh, so important? Why would someone want to make biological life? Yeah, sure. Uh, so th this is going to be a theological answer. Uh, and Great. This is, I'm uh, a theologian. <laughs> Maybe you could talk about something that I can understand. <laughs> All right, let's sure, see. sure. So, yeah, I mean, uh, my view, uh, I, you know, I'm in the classical Arminian view. Uh, I believe that God is a God of love. Uh, I believe that God wanted to create uh, people with a uh, free choice to uh, enter into relationship with him. So I kind of view the world as that, uh, that opportunity to give them the chance to freely choose to enter relationship with him. And so that is why we have the world around so us. So is God a biological being? No. Then why why would he create biological beings? None of what you said answers why he would make biological beings with DNA. Yeah, uh, and I, I think that is an interesting question, uh, and also not one that I've really given a whole lot of thought to of why he did it this way. I, I guess I would assert more that it seems to me that given the evidence, this is how he did it. 
Uh, and uh, it's not, you know, clear to me that there is a really good alternative way that, you know, you should have done it. Although, you know, maybe maybe you'd have a proposal on that. But, yeah, I'll just be honest. That's not a question that I've given a lot of <laughs> thought or study to. Now, David P., I, I want to ask you something that, that is related to something that you, you probably thought about. about intelli- it's a criticism of intelligent design uh, that, that's common uh, among skeptics and, and that sort of thing. And they'll say, look, intelligent design is unfalsifiable. Therefore, it's worthless. Um, what do you make of this objection? Is it true that intelligent design is, is not falsifiable and is therefore meaningless? No, just the opposite. Uh, so I actually, well, I'll make two points on that. Uh, so first of all, intelligent design is it's extremely easy to falsify it. Uh, take a piece of evidence that uh, would be used for intelligent design. So, you know, we've got things like new body forms appearing in the fossil record abruptly, irreducible complexity, or even the argument I've made here uh, from information in DNA. Take any argument for DNA, show how this uh, can be explained without recourse to intelligence. Intelligence design is falsified. So uh, I think ID is very easy to falsify. Uh, And when it comes down to it, I see that the main alternative, Darwinian evolution, is nearly impossible to falsify because, uh, you know, whenever we'll point to like gaps in the fossil record, uh, they'll say, well, you know, we haven't uh, had enough time to, you know, find the transitionals or, uh, you know, if you want uh, experiments that show us that mutation and natural selection can actually, like, <laughs> give us the type of changes that uh, are required to explain uh, the that are required to explain the various complexities of life. They'll just say, well, you know, we haven't conducted enough experiments. We haven't uh, had enough time. So actually I find Darwinism to be the much harder one to falsify. Yeah. I disagree with that. I think that's exactly backwards. Um, First of all, I don't know why you would talk about Darwinism. It's evolution. Uh, So uh, I don't, uh, I'm not entirely sure what certain Christians have against Darwin to the point that they've made the an anti-Darwin a kind of religious tenet for them. Darwinism, as if it were some kind of curse word. It's evolution. Study it. Um, but that said, um, I think it's just the opposite. Uh, evolution is easy to falsify. All you have to do is produce a god uh, who... Uh, announces that he created a universe and he can create another one and let us watch it. So th- this is, if your God, the kind of God that you say exists, exists, he can easily falsify every false notion that we have. Um, that's, that said, um, ID is simply not falsifiable because what you have at the bottom of it is a God hiding out in some other dimension that we can't access. And so no matter what physical processes uh, we show, um, you can always say, yes, but there's a God behind it. Uh, and yeah, he's invisible. You can't access it because he's over there and you're over here. So that there's no way to actually falsify it. But I, I, even just taking what you said, all you have to do is take the, you know, the, uh, uh, DNA and you know show how it's a natural process or I believe on the last show I heard you do it was flagellum uh, and show how that could be a last natural process before flagellum it was the eye how the human eye could be before and the fact is science keeps doing this right so th- this is uh, uh, what we call irreducible complexity uh, an idea that I uh, also have take issue with but uh every every time someone comes up with some irreducible complexity thing like the eye and uh, someone like dawkins uh points out very clearly how it happened in the past and we can see how it happened in the past by how it's happening today uh even with uh less evolved uh, creatures with different kinds of eyes uh then that doesn't make id uh proponents give up on id they just move to the next mystery and say, okay, we'll explain this. And, and so if we explain that, you'll just move to the next mystery. Uh, there's, there's no, I don't see any, um, I have no reason to believe that you would give up uh, if, if you saw a satisfactory explanation uh, of how DNA naturally formed. You just move to the next mystery. Well, so a few comments on that. First of all, there are many different theories of evolution beyond Darwinian evolution, uh, especially now. Uh, you know, we've got uh, different theories that it's not just mutation and natural selection, but that you've actually got like lateral gene transfer. Uh, we've got uh, 
the, the, the uh, we've got neo Lamarckian epigenetic uh, theories of evolution. Uh, you've got the whole extended evolutionary synthesis, which is distinctly different from Darwinian evolution. So it's just it's just false to say that there's only one uh, type of evolution. Uh, there are many many theories of evolution out there. Uh, of which neo Darwinism is the most prominent, which is why I wanted you know to specifically target that one because not all of my criticisms would apply to some of these other uh, newer theories of evolution. But then uh, moving on to this question of you know well uh, are we just you know always pushing it back a step? This kind of goes back to that I make and I got off the gaps argument. And as I've responded to, that is not true because I'm not saying I don't know, therefore intelligent designer. I'm saying because of what we do know, intelligent designer. Now let's just say that I granted all your examples like that we have explained how you got the how you get the bacterial flagellum i dispute those examples by the way i do want to be clear i do not think that we have uh, that there have been adequate uh, evolutionary explanations given but even if there had that does not itself prove that there will be a answer for uh, dna which is you know, what, what i'm focusing on here uh, you can't say well because we've always found a naturalistic explanation in the past therefore we all of a sudden can't consider this type of explanation uh, that would just seem to be manifestly fallacious to me uh, so yeah, those, that's my thoughts. Well, on that. but that's that's why I say that I don't. I think you're playing a little bit fast and loose when you say that would falsify uh, ID. It would not falsify ID uh, for you, and so I don't. I don't think that it is falsifiable uh, to Dale's All question. Right, well, well, let me nuance that a little. It would falsify that particular argument, and theoretically, you could do this for any argument. So if you shoot down some of our arguments, you can't say because I've shot these ones down, therefore they can all. Which be is shot why down. I'm saying um, it's not falsifiable because well, there, it, it there are always be. other places where you can find that are mysteries okay we'll we'll move to the next point this is this is one of the debate tactics of many people they you know they'll put out uh, a various thing and you'll you'll spend some time on that and they'll say okay well what about this okay well what about this uh, okay well i'm i'm done talking to you <laughs> <laughs> is 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 what yeah. that is, right? So um, that's that's how the whole ID debate since it started felt. Uh, this, especially the aspect of it of um, irreducible complexity. Uh, do you want to talk about ir irreducible complexity a little bit? It's a term we've thrown out here uh, at you know during the end of our discussion. Do uh, yeah. you think that's worth clarifying? Oh, yeah, you can do that. That's fine if you want to. Okay. The, well, it's the idea that a thing is. Uh, of a certain nature, uh, a mousetrap is a common example, uh, that if you if it lacked any of its parts, it would be useless. And so there's no way for that thing to be built on an evolutionary level piece by piece. It would have to be built with an intention of that, that final form from the beginning. Uh, it's irreducibly, com you can't reduce its complexity any further than what it is. Yeah, that would be a, an so, essentially correct definition. Right. So I not only do I disagree with all the specific examples of irreducible complexity, I disagree with the concept of irreducible complexity. Uh, this might get me into a little bit of trouble, so I say it to have a little bit of fun in the comments. Uh, maybe maybe some people can find uh, find this David, to be a target. But uh, David J. Um, sorry. Uh, because we're going to, we're moving on to a different topic, I, I did want to just follow up with you on this issue of falsifiability, and I, I wanted to flip it on you though. Like, couldn't couldn't the same thing be said, the same sorts of problems be said about proponents of quote unquote, what you call quote unquote evolution, or you know these specific model evolutionary models? It's it's unfalsifiable to them if we point out a, a certain problematic area, they just ignore that and come up well. There's overall the evidence is good like why, why couldn't the same problem of fault unfalsifiability be leveled against you uh, the non-intelligent design proponents well i suppose it depends on who you're arguing with but uh the case for evolution is not made on just one argument uh or one piece of evidence uh it's uh, made on uh you know overwhelming numbers of uh, pieces of evidence from all of the scientific fields from uh, many, many years. So, um, yeah, if you could, if you could overturn uh, one, say, um, you know, some, some, some part of the fossil record, and say that we were we were mistaken about that, 
you don't overturn the entire fossil record. Gotcha. Uh, sorry, I mean, that's that's just a single plank in it. Whereas with something like irreducible complexity, I can not only overturn, or science can not only overturn any given uh, point in irreducible complexity, I think philosophically one can argue against the idea of irreducible complexity. Yeah, and, and Dave, yeah, so I, I just wanted to, for the audience sake, I wanted to see that compare and contrast in, in how you guys address that. So, but yeah, I'll turn it to David P. to, to address, if he wants, uh, David's points about irreducible complexity then. Sure. I mean, irreducible complexity is not, you know, my, uh, is not the field that I have, you know, chosen to study a whole lot. I've done, you know, some study on it. Uh, so, insofar as I'm aware, uh, proposed uh, alternative examples to like say the bacterial flagellum these do not work um i, I am actually kind of curious to hear what david's uh and i don't know if we have time for this but i would be interested in hearing what david's like in principle objections are to irreducible complexity sure uh sure. the in principle objection is that you are looking at the object as it is and saying that's the goal and I, I, think I, I don't think that that's, that that's correct. The, the idea is that it can't get built because if it isn't as it is, then it doesn't exist. No, but see, that's the, that's the problem. You're, you're looking at the thing and saying that's what it's supposed to be. Like, for instance, the human eye. Uh, that's the goal. That's what it's supposed to be. But that's not true. And this is, this is what we've learned. That's actually not true. It's, the human eye is not the pinnacle of some plan uh, and it got put together that way. Uh, so there, you know, a partial eye still has function. It, it may not be much function to you as a human being, it still has function. Um, and it, it, also, it also assumes, well, read, read Darwin. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I will put up a helpful uh, video in sources. Um, okay. So uh, it also assumes that the human eye is the pinnacle of what uh, eyes can be. Uh, I can imagine another, you know, few hundred years, uh, we could have x-ray vision. And the people with those eyes would say, well, what do you mean? People had eyes that couldn't see through uh, uh, metal? What, <laughs> what good would an eye like that be? Um, and so, yeah, I think... Uh, Anytime you have something with a lot of uh, complex pieces, like a mousetrap, just keeping it simple, uh, one of the things that a mousetrap has in it is a block of wood or some kind of, uh, you know, maybe a metal uh, base. But we'll just say a block of wood since those are the mousetraps that I used to buy um, when I was little. So you might say, well, what good is a block of wood? How does that catch a mouse? <laughs> maybe a block of wood doesn't catch a mouse. Uh, maybe that's not the point at all. But blocks of wood of that size have lots of utility. Um, and even if you wanted to catch a mouse, maybe a block of wood helps you bash a mouse uh, on the head. There are all kinds of utility for each and every part of the mousetrap before it becomes a mousetrap. Uh, maybe the little pointy thing helps you stab at a mouse. Uh, you know, ev design is a matter of evolution in and of itself and remixing, uh, remixing what we already have. Uh, for greater functions. And so, uh, yeah, just because you don't have a modern mousetrap doesn't mean that the components of that mousetrap are useless. Okay, yeah, uh, this, this sounds kind of like a co-option argument against it. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my point is that there's kind of an, an empirical issue there is that nobody has actually demonstrated how you could have that with a specific... With a specific... Uh, examples uh, of things that are offered as evidence for irreducible complexity but obviously as i've said this isn't my uh, this is not my preferred area of study so uh, you know you it, it could be right that there are answers on that front uh, i'll just say if there are i haven't seen them gotcha okay well i think what we can do at this point um covered uh, all of my general areas uh, of questioning let me, I'll turn it to both parties. So we'll start first with David P. Is there any issue that you'd like to discuss with David that we, we haven't brought up in, in this that you'd like to have a discussion with David on? 
No, I, I thought this would, you know, generally focus more on, you know, evidence for intelligent design. And he, he seems to more want to take the route, you know, if I grant it, uh, does this get us to God? And, you know, obviously from the beginning, I've granted that in and of itself. It does not. So we, we do seem to be agreed on that point. Gotcha. And, and David Jay, is there anything that we, any topic that you'd like to discuss with David P that we haven't covered in, in this show so far? Yeah, I think... Um... I think the whole point of the argument from design um, is God. And I think it's a little bit disingenuous to pretend that it's not. And so um, no one no one is lobbying to get intelligent designs taught in school for its own sake. <laughs> they, have a, they have a religious uh, uh, theological uh, ends to that. And I think on a podcast like this, you kind of have to go there. Um, Otherwise, it, there's no point. Now, given that we have both granted kind of uh, proposals that would render the other side's arguments moot, I would still say that um, on design, on, on the question of design, uh, there are some questions about the designer and the goal that become necessary if you're going to if you're going to pursue that further. I would say on matters of irreducible complexity, which I think is at the center of some of the quote unquote scientific thinking of design, I think that it's it's bad philosophy as well as bad science uh, because constituent components are useful. They're just not necessarily useful for the end thing that we have designed right now. So I can take a, a stick of wood and a, a chunk of metal, and I can look at what both of those things are good for. What they're not good for is a hammer. But if I put those two things together, then suddenly they're good for this other thing, a hammer. And it, and it does you no good to say, well, you know, it couldn't have possibly been useful if you disassembled the hammer. Of course it could. Have. <laughs> uh, it just wasn't a hammer. And so when you make an argument like that, and I know that uh, David has not uh, landed on uh, irreducible complexity because that's kind of a difficulty in his argument, but once you make an argument like that, um, then, uh, then what you're looking at is the end goal of the design. You are making some statements about what you think the design is and what it's meant to be. And so if David wants to talk about intelligent design uh, then I think that he needs to talk about, be willing to talk about what he thinks the design is and what it's supposed to be. Like, for instance, the universe as it exists now, the human body, the human DNA as it exists now, um, is, that what, is that what you think the goal is? Because if it is, that's problematic, and we can have some conversation around that. Uh, are you saying that the evolutionary process is complete now, that we're not further evolving? Because if we further evolve, then how can you say that the goal is the current human now? Uh, and why may not the goal have been bonobos? Um, you know, and further evolution just doesn't matter past that point. So there are some things that you would have to say that I do think makes the argument very difficult for the Christian to carry on, which is why they like to keep it at this very generic, very milk toast um, place where we are now. So I hope that we can go further in the comments. Otherwise, it's going to be a pretty boring week. Yeah, and these are all, you know, great, great uh, topics, great conversations to have. Uh, the issue is that most of those are not you know, scientific issues. Most of them are theological issues. So, you know, where I would, you know, just go with that is, uh, you know, so, so what if uh, we're, uh, you know, at where we should be, whether we're going to evolve further, uh, whether there are irreducibly complex things or whether these things have function uh, for the specific argument that I'm making from DNA. None of that really has any bearing on whether or not it was designed. See, whether we are, uh, you know, at where we're supposed to be or whether we would progress further than that. Uh, my argument that uh, the specific sequences of the nucleotide bases requires an intelligent cause, that argument holds regardless of whether uh, there's anywhere we're going from here or not or whether, you know, you have uh, other usages for constituent parts. Uh, so all of that just kind of seems to, you know, not address that argument like at all. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I think I think we can close out now. Um, I'll, I'll 
let each side uh, make a, a quick closing statement. Do, do you want to do closing statements? Uh, I don't know with the new format. If you uh, sure, no, I'll I'll do a very quick one. Um, it won't be any longer than my opening statement, which is um, at the end of the day, I find these apologetic arguments. Uh, to be useless. You know, the Christian is always talking about an accumulative case, but I've never seen the accumulation made. <laughs> right? I've never seen the, the bridge fully built. All I've seen is a half a bridge or the first part of a bridge and then maybe the end of the bridge, but not the middle work of the bridge. <laughs> and they, they never seem to want to show their work as to how they got from the first part of the bridge to the next part of the bridge. Uh, and, and with... Pretty much all of these uh, apologetic arguments, maybe not the ontological ar ar argument, you can just grant them <laughs> and uh, and find that the Christian has nowhere to go from there. They will have to they will have to move past that. Stop pretending like that argument actually meant anything, uh, and force them to go to the thing that they really care about. Uh, now, on in in terms of these um, apologetic arguments, I think they share another weakness as well. Uh, and one of their worst weaknesses is one of the things that I think they consider a strength is that it depends on a lot of knowledge of uh, math and science. Uh, and I honestly think that religion uh, does not and should not require any knowledge of math and science. Uh, but they are they are taking their argument into places where they know that their audience is not an expert. And, you know, maybe dazzle them with some dialogue. Um, and, and win that way. But it's important to note that these arguments are not coming from experts. <laughs> They're coming from people uh, who have simply uh, learned certain, certain talking points, but neither David nor I are experts in this, and yet his argument is very, very much science-focused, and he doesn't want to talk about theology. I think that that is a... Uh, I think that is emblematic of a lot of the uh, new apologists uh, today. And I, I think that it's very empty. You don't make a lot of converts that way. And I think that brand of apologetics doesn't even stop the bleeding that much, which is why Christians uh, are, are losing ground uh, in so many ways. And so I would say just kind of watch the bouncing ball and um, kind of recognize it for what it is. Uh, and when it's time to have a real debate about a real God with real effects in the universe, let's do that. Otherwise, um, they said there would be no math. So I'm, I'm done with that. All right, cool. And, and we'll uh, turn it over to, to our guest, David P., uh, or to David's guest, uh, David P., to, to give his final closing statement. Yeah, I'll just say uh, that the argument that I have made has, you know, effectively gone untouched. So um, I would just say that uh, the best explanation then of the facts uh, that we have from biology is that it is intelligently designed. Now, whether there are theistic implications for that, you know, that's a discussion that we could have at another point. You know, I would actually, I, I actually applaud David Johnson on, uh, you know, having Christians to build that bridge because this is actually, in my view, something that is not given enough attention in popular, you know, apologetics is that instead, you know, we focus on these arguments, which are, you know, granted, those are usually the more controversial points. David is somewhat unique in that he, um, doesn't think that you can get uh, to uh, theistic conclusions from these arguments. Obviously, you know, I disagree with him on that, but that it is a separate conversation. Uh, and I would just like to talk about this point about how, um, you know, do you need to have all of this knowledge to be a Christian, um, you know, to be a religious person? And I think the answer is an emphatic no. You don't need to have it. Um, you know, something like uh, design, I think, is just evident. Uh, studies show that it is natural for people, even people raised in, uh, you know, atheist uh, families, uh, you know, or with atheist parents, it is natural for them to see uh, the world as, or the natural world as being designed. Uh, so it's only when people, you know, start bringing in, alternative naturalistic explanations that we, you know, have to go deeper to, you know, defend that the, uh, or to defend what I see as a natural intuition, as in fact being genuine, I think that, you know, the scientific evidence bears that out. But I'm not by any means saying that you have to have that knowledge in order to be a religious person or even to be justified in it. But, um, you know, in as much as there are criticisms at that deep level, I think it is appropriate that Christians can go to the deeper level to uh, answer these sorts of objections. And, you know, the claims that they're not coming from experts, uh, you know, that may 
in a sense be true that there aren't you know a whole lot of phd biologists making the argument that i'm making but the essential points of my argument that is completely correct um you know they agree that we do not have a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life uh nobody disputes that intelligent causes can account for um can't account for information and uh certainly that's the whole premise of the theory of evolution that we should explain uh effects of the past by reference to what we uh, know can uh, can accomplish them in the present which is the principle that my argument works off of so all the pieces of the argument even if you don't have experts putting them together they're going to affirm uh the points of it so um you know the point that it's not experts making these arguments just it, it doesn't um seem to carry a whole lot of weight to me but uh, yeah i mean I, i'm content to leave it at that you know i think we've had a good discussion uh, i've enjoyed it and so yeah thanks so much Awesome. Yeah. Well, well thanks to, to both uh, David J and to David P for, for a good discussion, giving us something to think about and giving us sort of a lay of the land on this this argument of design uh, from the DNA, information in DNA. And uh, yeah, David, since it's your show, I guess I'll, I'll turn the reins over to you to make any announcements or, or whatever you need to do. Okay, uh, so normally I, I probably wouldn't make an announcement. In this case, uh, the uh, book, uh, Surviving Corona, Believers and Non-Believers uh, Examine Their Worldview in This Time of Crisis. Uh, that book is complete. By the time you hear this, I was hoping that it would be out and I would tell, be able to tell you where to get it. But Amazon is taking the maximum amount of time uh, to approve this, and so it is not out yet and i don't plan to put the free version up before uh the for sale version is out there that will be two dollars 99 cents uh, at amazon all proceeds will be going to the international red cross for uh coronavirus relief i did forget to mention one contributor the last time i talked about this uh to my shame uh justin Briarly is also a contributor so uh we've got um Dare I try it? We've got Randall Rouser, Natalie Collins, uh, Thomas Ord, David Russell, Justin Brierly, um, Matthew uh, Taylor, Sophie Dumas, and um, Andrew, uh, a, a late entrant, uh, so you hadn't heard me mention his name, Andrew Knight uh, has a chapter, and uh, yours truly. Uh, and so, once again, that'll be two ninety nine. dollars uh, it's it's almost time to spend that money, people. I know you've been saving it for a while. Two ninety nine uh, at Amazon. Uh, all proceeds going to uh, the International Red Cross for coronavirus uh, relief. So uh, look out for those announcements. Press release is already written. Just waiting to pull the trigger. Um, so that's that's all I've got for now. Oh uh, yeah, next week. Uh, no, that's not next week. So never mind. I, I almost made an announcement for next week for a show that's not coming up just yet. So um, yeah, so that's uh, that's that's it for now. Uh, whatever happens next week, it's gonna be great. Thanks for thanks for having us. It's a great show. All right, bye bye everybody.